Okay. Good afternoon. I now call to order the, the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for April 27th, 2023. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and it's being held live and virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Booker, T Ms. Booker Dwyer? Ms. Hassan? Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Present, Boswell McComas. <laughs> Dr. Holmes? Ms. Shea? Dr. Wistead, Dr. Ellendorf, Dr. Ferguson, Ms. Myers, Present. and do you want me to call the additional? Yeah, please call and note the names of all staff members participating in the meeting. We have Dr. Broder, Present. Ms. Rahman, Ms. Mustafer, Present. Dr. Kraft. And Dr. Wolf. Um, okay, I need to pause for a second. Um, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then saying their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. Okay, if the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will move and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then stay, may have a roll call vote. Assistants will, sp will, speak, will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. All right, all right. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> That's not in the <laughs> script, but I'm thanking everybody for their patience. Okay, first we will have the, um, the textbooks and instructional materials. And I think Mache is ready to answer any questions concerning textbooks and instructional materials. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. PowerPoint. Trey, do you have the PowerPoint? <laughs> you still can't get into the meeting? Can you connect as guest? That's okay. Don't, don't, you don't have to worry about it. We have the PowerPoints, but. Right. Yeah, Megan, Ms. Shea, would you like to start? Sure. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Megan Shea. Um, the purpose of this contract is to allow for. Uh, competitive pricing for schools and offices to purchase a wide range of textbooks across all the different content areas. So in the presentation, I identified some specific examples of textbooks uh, covering everything from visual arts to career and technical education, novels uh, supporting the ELA curriculum, uh, plant and field guides for some of our advanced science courses, um, as well as professional learning texts that schools uh, purchase. So uh, typically this contract, um, as you could see from um, what we talked about, there are about 13 different vendors ranging from um, the book rack or Cengage Learning um, all the way to teacher created materials. And uh, what it does is if we have a textbook that um, has been previously approved, is still in use, 
um, then it will often move to this contract for any replenishment or replacement. So if you take an example of like a career and technical education textbook that may have been approved many years ago and is still current and in use in classrooms, um, this would be how schools would purchase additional copies or replenishments um, as they need it if the course enrollment were to increase or if a um, misplacing material. So the majority of the spending, um, and we will have specific breakdowns for the contract committee, but the majority of the spending, the majority of the purchase orders um, do come directly from schools. Um, but it is also available for offices, including Title I, Advanced Academics, and of course, um, my office. Um, schools can use a variety of operating funds, as well as we do use some grants, including uh, the ESOL office can use the Title III grant, as well as the immigrant grant, and our CTE offices and schools can also use Perkins funding, um, as well as Title I schools can use Title I funding. So where it says grants, those are just some examples. And I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions from committee members? Go ahead. Stomanowski? Just one. Um, does this include leveled readers? So the contract, the um, materials listed in the book, I do not believe include leveled readers. The publishers would include, you know, some of the bookstores, but those particular titles are not included in this database. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Sure. Oh, we need to get approval. Okay, so may I have a motion um, to approve the textbooks and instructional materials contract? So moved, Hassan. Thank you. Is there a sec? Is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote, please? Miss Lichter. Yes. Miss Pumphrey. Yes. Miss Dominowski. Yes. Miss Hassan. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next one we will discuss is the third party world language assessment contract and Ms. Shea will present that one. Hello again, still me. Um, so this contract is for a the continued use of a third party world languages assessment. Um, it's used by both um, for uh, the Office of World Languages and ESOL. And so um, what we actually do now, we started about two years ago. We assess at the end of seventh grade in world languages so that we can use that um, data to provide students and their teachers with very specific um, feedback across the four domains of language, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And then the reason we do it at the end of seventh grade is to help with that really important eighth grade registration for high school. So our goal is we're trying to help more of our students get to advanced world languages courses and ultimately earn the seal of biliteracy. And so we want to make sure that we don't lose any ground and that we know specifically by the beginning of eighth grade what's the most appropriate placement for high school registration in the hope that our students can go into high school at that level three and beyond so that they're on track to earn the Maryland seal of biliteracy. Um, we also use this for our high school students that want to earn the seal of biliteracy um, across multiple languages. And so any student in our system can use this test as a way of demonstrating that they have mastered their language. Um, so if you think about some of our multilingual learners and approaching that from an asset-based mindset, in order to earn the seal of biliteracy, students have to demonstrate literacy in both English, which they do through our MCAP ELA 10 assessment, and through another world language. For our multilingual learners, oftentimes um, demonstrating that proficiency in a world language comes first. And so this is a way for us to support them in demonstrating the proficiency in both their L1 and in their L2, which would be English. Um, and that way they can also earn a credential. Um, this is also, I know at the last board meeting you were talking a lot about the star ratings and MSDE. One of the ways that high schools can earn a part of their stars for college and career readiness is through the number of students that earn the seal of biliteracy. So the purpose of this contract is to allow for for the continued use of that assessment at seventh grade for all students enrolled in world language, and then for high school students that can choose from a variety of languages uh, to demonstrate that proficiency, which they can also demonstrate through AP exams and several other language assessments. Thank you. Questions from members? Go ahead, Ms. Nemanowski. Sorry, I have a couple. Um, so if you're taking this test in the seventh grade, when do we start? An, um, giving the option to, to learn a second language in schools. Like, is it, is it offered in all of our schools for all of our kids? Yes, all of our middle schools offer world languages um, instruction beginning in sixth grade. 
and not in elementary school at all? Some of our schools have the passport program that um, students begin having exposure in Spanish only through the passport program in grades four and five. So how many students took the this test this in the seventh grade this year or last year? So we're just engaging in the Apple this year, but it's every seventh grader that takes it, unless for some reason they're not in a world of world language class. I believe last year the number was just under 9,000 seventh grade students. It was 9,000 seventh. Just so under, yeah. I can get you more specific numbers exact by school if that's helpful. Okay, I was just trying to figure sure. out how you um, assume that you came to the figure of 600,000 um, right. more. Part of the increase is actually a, a good news increase. When we originally requested the spending authority, it was just for seventh grade. What we've seen a tremendous increase is the number of high school students that are opting to use it to demonstrate and earn that seal in high school, and sometimes doing it in more than one language. Um, so that is part of the requested increase, is to allow for still maintaining it at seventh grade, but then to also open it for high school students and our multilingual learners, which was not a part of our original calculation. And then my last question. Um, why are we charging five dollars to take the test again? It says I think I in the it, it was in the, in the um, presentation that the first time it's you're covered, but if you'd fail it and you want to take it again, we're charging students five dollars. Uh, no, that's the cost for us. Yeah. We don't for the, the students don't pay that. That's the that's cost by student, the vendor. right? The county absorbs it. Is that what you're saying? Right, right. So what, what and, and I, forgive me if it was unclear in the recording, the cost is $20 for us to give the assessment. The um, contract allows for us to reassess at a reduced rate, but none of that cost is put onto a student. Students don't have to pay no. that? No. Okay. We were just showing the d differentiation that we don't pay $20 every time they retake okay. it. Okay. That's just was kind of... I apologize. <laughs> no, no, that that's unclear? okay. Yeah, yeah. No, none of the better. cost goes to the <laughs> students. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Any other questions, uh, Ms. Pumphrey? You partially answered my question, but what I w my question was, um, what percentage of high school students are you seeing that are opting into taking this? That's a great question, and I can follow up with more specific numbers because, um, unfortunately, our Director of World Languages couldn't be here with me today, but um, when we come for the contracts, I just learned, actually, this contract may go in June instead of May, but when we come for that, I also want to share all the SEALs earners that we have, so I can bring that, um, I can follow up with Dr. McComas to share that so you can see the number of students and the number of SEALs we're earning across our high schools. Okay, thank you. Sure. I just have a curious question. Sure. If you earn the seal of biliteracy, then when you go to college, do they still require you to take um, foreign language, or can that does that count? No. So it would depend on your major, of course. Right. So but if you're a world language if major, major if it's a requirement, basis. right? But yeah, you have demonstrated actually the level of proficiency required to teach a world language in the state of Maryland. So it's a pretty oh. high designation, and also comes with a pretty cool medal for graduation. Oh. Just on that, our world language teachers, this is like one of their professional credential assessments. Right. Um, so any of our high school or uh, world language teachers have taken the AFL and it will indicate their level of fluency as part of their certification in that language. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I think you answered this with Christina, but I just wanted to make sure. sure. You're going to tell us um, about how many, the percentage Absolutely. of students that are, are receiving the... The, the seal. seal, yep. I'll okay. give you the seal counts by school, um, by language. We have that data. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, may I have a motion to pass the third party world language assessment contract? So moved, Pumphrey. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hassan. Thank you. Roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next presentation is mathematics grade six through algebra two pro program six through algebra two. contract oh yes. and that's Ms. Shea too that okay. is Ms. Shea I thought maybe I, you I'm were joined her today right. by and I can welcome her up, her up. Um, our director of mathematics is here with us today Kasalia Mshinda she's probably she's, being polite you can come not on up not moving <laughs> Again, um, we've gotten out of practice. Uh, I know, it's <laughs> a person okay. thing, so well, thank you for and, the... Well, uh, and Ms. Machinda only joined us about a year. She's never had a face-to-face -face meeting, oh. so um, this is uh, her first, but I'm happy for all of you to meet her because she's a fantastic asset to our team. 
um, in BCPS. Um, so this contract, as you know, as part of our uh, curricular audit for math that was done several years ago, we have completely overhauled the mathematics curriculum in BCPS. Uh, we're almost at the finish line with, I think, Algebra 2 is our last push. Um, and we identified illustrative math for grades um, advanced five through our Algebra 2, so middle grades as well as Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. The reason that we need to come forward for a modification um, is because we need to increase the spending authority. The original contract estimation for the spending authority did not include our middle school grades. We started with um, Algebra 1 and Geometry, actually, in grade 8. Um, we started with Geometry, forgive me, and then uh, went to middle school. And uh, so that's a part of it, is um, grades 6 through 8 do are in their first year of illustrative math. Um, a second piece that has contributed to the need for increased spending um, is around the consumable workbooks. So when thinking about a purchase, you want to make sure that you have enough spending authority to replenish those consumable workbooks for schools automatically. Um, I will share with you, because this predated um, Ms. Mshinda joining our team, at one point, secondary teachers, uh, the feedback we had with our geometry teachers, we weren't sure that uh, middle schools and high schools were going to use consumable books in math, because that was a very big shift. And we talked about how there's digital resources. Um, the feedback we've gotten from teachers is that that is an important part. They do want to have that um, individual student book, which is part of why we um, need the increased spending authority to continue to provide that. And we've gotten that feedback from families as well. Um, and then the other piece in the original contract, um, so when we purchase illustrative math, illustrative math is the curriculum, but Kendall Hunt is the vendor that we purchase illustrative math through. In the original contract that was brought forward two years ago, um, originally the professional development was going to be a separate contract, and now we are able to include the professional development spending within Kendall Hunt for illustrative math. Um, so that's really the, the rationale for the increase. Do you have anything you want to add? For okay. <laughs> Questions? Ms. Stemanowski? Um, I, I just, so this contract was started, it was originated in, in June of 2021. Yes. What has been the impact on our students as far as um, the success of this program and the feedback from teachers? You want me to go for, I can go first and then you can join. Um, so for, um, it's new, right? And so the, the feedback that we've gotten from teachers at the secondary level, it is a very different approach to the teaching of mathematics. Um, most of the feedback centers on, they know we need to meet the rigor of the standards. They know that having an evidence-based curriculum is really critical for BCPS, and it's a lot to learn in a short amount of time. So that's the general feedback. Um, just like everything else, I have people that absolutely love illustrative math. I had two principals last week, one middle and one high, tell me that it has completely changed math instruction and discourse in their building. Um, and then I still hear from teachers who want to teach the way they were taught, and th that's a struggle. So in in full transparency, I have both. Um, in terms of achievement, it's too soon at the middle school for me to really give that answer. We have seen some schools that are seeing success in geometry because this is the second year that they're using the curriculum and feel more confident. Um, and I will also say um, this is, I think, the first year that we're using it with our advanced five. Is that correct? They started. They started. Okay. Um, so we're hoping to see that increase over time. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that feedback. Kasele, Kasele um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, so the advanced five uh, did begin at the original um, rollout of illustrative mathematics, and elementary school teachers are using the illustrative math program, and they are enjoying the difference in the discourse that it's requiring for students to exhibit as they elicit their thinking, and how that is going to prepare students in middle grades to continue doing that kind of thinking. Um, where we're just now rolling it in. So I think we will also see some growth with the students who are in elementary then rolling up to uh, middle school using the same resource with the same pedagogy. Yeah. Okay, um, and that one more, I think. Um, how is this different or is this going to replace um, other contracts which are still, which we're still, um, you know, open with, um, there's the JNI 72915 College Prep Math Algebra 2. That's good through the 25. Um, mm -hmm. The Send Math, that's good through 24. And the Envision Math, which is good through 25 as well. Are these, are these are we trying to end those contracts? Yes, so Envision Math, um, we no longer use. That was the elementary program that was replaced by Bridges. Um, the um, 
Ascend Math is actually a um, math intervention. It's not a core program and curriculum. Um, and uh, the other curriculum, that you, the other contract you referenced, Algebra 2 is the next frontier for illustrative math. So those teachers have not yet transitioned to illustrative math. But once they do, we will no longer spend against that other contract. So the ones that we're no longer using, I, I think you said was the um, Envision. And mm -hmm. are we, I mean, are you? with the money that's left on that contract, is it, where is it going? So, go ahead. <laughs> so, thank you for the question, because it's a great opportunity to clarify the difference between contract authority and actual spending. The authority just gives us permission, just because it's, it's like a credit card, right? You might have the permission to have $5,000 on it, but you may only spend 2000 and you never use that other three. And so that's sort of the difference here. So as we stand down those products and, and move to illustrative math, what happens is we don't spend on that contract and that, that whole authority sunsets. And there's no, more, there's no need to spend against it because we've shifted materials. I, I, I'm just, um, it, it, my, my problem is, is that it's still open. Like it hasn't been closed yet. It still goes through 2024 and we're still buying more things on top of it. And I understand what I'm saying, and it looks like we're just keep buying new products and new products right. and I, not explaining why. You know. Yeah, I do. I completely understand your question because I've answered this question with lots of boards over uh, eight years. It, it is a misperception that just because the authority is still open that we are still spending. Right. That's a misperception among a lot of people. And I don't know, Ms. Shea, if you want to speak, if you, you may be able to uh, clarify even. Y yeah, so, um, I, and I do think it's a, a fair question to certainly bring up around then why don't we just cancel or close contracts? And I'm not the best person to answer that. That's really a procurement question. But to Dr. McComas's point, there's no money in the budget allocated for Envision. There's no money in the budget. There will not be once we add Algebra 2 for that. Um, why we don't go, I think it's probably just um, not the practice, right? But there's not um, any funding in the budget allocated for that. Um, it's sort of, to use the credit card analogy, you could cut up the credit card and call the company and cancel it, or it can just sit in your wallet and you never use it. Um, it's the same analogy. We're not spending, there's no funding for, we're not paying for two Algebra two programs at the same time or two elementary math programs at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's, I, I just wanna say thank you for bringing it because it, it, is, it is something that there's often much misunderstanding and confusion around that. So every opportunity we have to talk about that and, and unpack that is important for the community and for everyone involved. It is a great question also for when you're working with the contracts committee itself in procurement, right? right. Because our purpose here is what's the instructional lens yeah. and they're the, the business experts who work through all that um, procurement pr process. So thank you. Other questions? Okay, may we have a motion to um, approve the mathematics grade six through algebra two program contract? So moved, Hassan. Thank you, is there a second? Second Pumphrey. Thank you, may we roll call vote please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next contract is Feedback and Customer Service Solutions for Schools. Um, and that is Dr. Brodar, did I say it right? Okay. So welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, yeah. uh, Curriculum Committee and Chair Lichter. Uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Brodar and I am the Coordinator of Program Evaluation in the Office of Research. As Mr. Connolly described in the presentation, uh, the K-12 Insight platform is a web-based survey platform that we use for data collection. Um, we are bringing this forward, as this contract forward as a one-year, four-month extension to the current contract, uh, which is set to expire um, August of 2023, this year. And so I am happy to answer any other questions that you may have about K-12 Insight or how we use it. Questions from board members? Ms. Dominowski. Well, see, they know that you look through these PowerPoints. They know you've done your homework. Do my homework. Right. Um, I actually just, um, I wanted to know if there was uh, room for expansion with this program as far as, you know, can we ask um, surveys with open-ended questions to get more feedback from our students and teachers? Can we use it to get 
um, you know, more instantaneous feedback with new pilot programs, uh, or, or is it being used that way? Uh, yes, thank you for that question. Yes, K-12 Insight is multifaceted in its usage, so we are able incorporate um, open-ended questions and get feedback of that nature. And there are offices and or departments right now who currently do solicit feedback through open-ended responses. Also, is there a way um, students and teachers could do this and not like anonymous, anonymous, anonymously sometimes, um, especially when it's sensitive subjects that kids or anyone really would feel more comfortable if they weren't, you know, known right away like is that that an option um, are you asking whether or not the survey has a like an anonymous correct yes yes so for an example uh, our stakeholder climate survey that we receive 65,000 responses on those are all anonymous and so um, yes we don't it is absolutely the platform um, doesn't collect data that would attach to any student or um, staff okay thank you yeah other questions? Okay, then can I have a motion to approve the, whoops, sorry, f um, feedback and customer services solutions for schools? So moved, Dominowski. Thank you. May I have a second? Second, Pumphrey. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next contract is on college and career web-based platform. And I think we're having Dr. Ferguson and Ms. Mustafer and uh, Ms. Mur right, but that's not the name that's there. That's why I'm looking very puzzled. <laughs> okay, Ms. Raman? Ramin. New name? Oh, okay, thank you. Okay, welcome. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, Kim Ferguson. Um, I am here with Ms. Ramin, who is the coordinator of school counseling, who will lead our discussion primarily, and um, Ms. Mustafa, who is the director of student support services. Um, this is a web-based college and career exploration program. Um, and we are hoping that you will um, support us with this new contract. So um, I know you've see, seen the PowerPoint, so um, did you have any specific questions? I have a question. So is this replacing the one that we've been using, and I can't think of the name. Beyonce. Yes, yes. Yeah. is that replacing? Okay, yeah. all right. Yes, this will replace it. And what are the different, what are the benefits for, for this one over the one that we've been using? These years. Um, I would say that the benefits would include some of the additional features that we would acquire as part of this new contract. And so there are features related to accessibility, um, world languages, and being able to translate information. Um, there is a course planner that allows for long-term planning and projected planning for students to um, continue that six-year plan process with their school counselor. Um, there is curriculum that um, really supports those students who may be looking to go into vocation um, and just really having an opportunity to look at um, the program it really was giving a little bit more robust support to our middle school students and helping to prepare them prior to getting to high school and really working with their counselors on what they would like to do and for their post-secondary planning and does this where how does a six-year plan fit into this well, our counselors meet with students every year, and so starting in seventh grade, we have conversations that really talk about um, rigorous course options and, and more or less senior options in general. So um, how do students um, have a path to rigor? Internships, dual enrollment, early graduation, and so this is an opportunity for you to project out, look at what courses, what extracurricular activities schools have that support a student's plan for their high school um, career as well as beyond. Thank you, and just two comments. One, I really like the feature where they can map out, like you said, um, their four years. And then the other one was thank you for putting in the phase-in plan because um, how we're going to 
transition kids from what they've been using. So thank you for those. Other questions, Ms. Pumphrey? Just a comment. I wanted to thank you because I could tell by the PowerPoint that um, your research and review of this product was extensive. Um, I have a junior in high school and I have a daughter that graduated recently. And the daughter that graduated, really, we found no usefulness in Naviance whatsoever. Um, so I'm very thankful to see this product. I'm just a little jealous that my junior won't get to experience it. <laughs> so um, just thank you. I think it looks like a, like a wonderful product. Thank you. I'm excited. Ms. Dominowski? <laughs> Okay, then, do I have a motion to approve the college and career web-based platform contract? So moved, Pumphrey. Second, Dominowski. Um, may I have a roll call vote, please? <laughs> Thank you, guys. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hassan? Yes. Thank you. Okay, it passes. Thank you very much. Sorry about my yeah. brain <laughs> up here. Okay, and... I'm like, <laughs> that was all the appetizer for the main course, right? So we are now going to have a presentation on the elementary school ELA pilots from Ms. Shea and Dr. Kraft. Well, we're getting set up for our ELA for our, our staff um, and faculty who are here that are already finished with their items. You're welcome to leave. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ferguson, your team's welcome to leave if you need to. M Dr. Broder as well. Thank you. Thank you again. So uh, thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get us started here. It looks like the team's in place. So as, as you know, we have been working our way through uh, two pilot programs to replace our overall elementary reading and writing curriculum, right? Now that complements the foundational phonics program that we discussed last time. Um, and so this would be our comprehensive reading and writing program for K to 5. Um, and both these products are aligned with the state requirements. What's really, this, this is um, such a critical decision for us as a community because we know literacy is our core mission. And this is laying out the foundation for every student to have a strong literacy instruction every day in every classroom. So at that, I will turn it over to the team uh, to get started on our presentation. Please um, stop and ask us questions along the way. We want to make sure that um, you have full understanding of both products. Um, and then at the end, we'd like to make a recommendation around a particular one of the two products. But we want to make sure you have full understanding of both before we get to that recommendation. Thank you, Dr. McComas. So as um, Dr. McComas said, this has been quite a long journey um, to identify a core series for ELA. And so what we'd like to do this afternoon is present uh, what we call our body of evidence and really walk you through um, the uh, rationale and the strengths of both programs. I want to start by introducing on my right, I have Dr. Kraft, is of course our director of ELA, but we're also joined by Dr. Wolf, who is the elementary coordinator. Um, Dr. Kraft, Dr. Wolf, and the entire ELA team, as well as all the schools, have done a tremendous amount of work with these pilots. It is a big lift to try anything new. We've had some schools try two new programs uh, to really help give us feedback because this is such a critical decision for our kids. So I just want to say on record how grateful I am to the team, but also to all the schools, teachers, principals, reading specialists, staff development teachers, um, and kids that have really helped us because we couldn't do this work without them. Um, as Dr. McComas said, both products meet the standards. And we're going to look in a minute at some of the third party reviews. So for us, the body of evidence that we want to lay out is how does it support in BCPS our strategic plan and our teaching and learning framework. And so what you see up there right now with our guiding question is really thinking about the way that the curricula best aligns with our beliefs about teaching and learning. Uh, we have five core beliefs that guide our teaching and learning framework. Equitable access, high expectations, culturally relevant pedagogy, responsive instruction, and professional learning communities. Um, and so you can see that as we walk through the body of evidence today about these two programs and what we've learned about each um, and what we um, have considered um, to frame our recommendation, we will always be aligning them back to those guiding beliefs. So you can go to the next slide. As um, we've talked uh, many times as a team, and I think you may have a copy of the Comar language in your um, folder on the left-hand side. Um, 
Comar requires that we have an evidence-based curriculum for ELA and math and that we certify it every year and it details there why. So uh, that law in September of 2020 um, really is part of what started us down this path of identifying a high quality evidence-based curricula. And you can see there that both products have multiple third party reviews um, that in which it meets expectations um, in all areas for K through five. And that's important to note because part of our efforts, we are going to share strengths and um, areas of growth for both. There is no perfect curricula out there. Um, that's why all different school systems work together and rely on these third-party reviewers. What's wonderful is that the baseline now is that it's evidence-based. So now the job is for us to think about how does it align with our needs and what is the feedback we're getting from the classrooms with implementation. So I'm going to, at this point, turn it over. Um, Dr. Kraft and Dr. Wolf will just walk through a couple of the criteria that we used looking specifically at each program and talk about those strengths and needs in relation to our teaching and learning framework. As Ms. Shea said, we are using our teaching and learning framework, so we're going to start with equitable access, and so uh, we're going to start with project-based inquiry. And so when we look at the project-based inquiry for both programs, we really want to think about um, how is equitable access evident for that project-based inquiry. And research-based writing has historically been a low data point for us, and so it was important for us to look at this particular aspect of both programs. And so what we saw in both programs is there are multiple and flexible methods of presentation to give students varying ways of acquiring and demonstrating the knowledge that they've acquired through the research. And what we also notice is that uh, there is some student voice and agency uh, where students can really um, select what they are interested in and connect in different ways. Um, and so both uh, programs did provide that. Um, Savvis uh, structure um, for My View Literacy is, uh, it is the sixth week of instruction in the unit. Um, and in HMH, it's built in throughout the three weeks of the unit. So their modules are a little bit different. HMH has three modules and um, my view has the five weeks and so both of them um, do allow for equitable access um, next slide when we look at English language learner support um, both programs do um, provide support for our uh, multilingual learners uh, and they are both aligned to WIDA, which is really important so that we can go to a body of knowledge that we know has uh, prepared standards to move our students forward. Um, and so they both are aligned and it calls it out for it for the teachers so the teachers know if your student is has been designated at this level using WIDA access, this is where you could provide additional scaffolds and supports. And so, uh, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, it is the, uh, so WIDA Access is the um, assessment that we use uh, to determine uh, the level of our students in terms of developing English language proficiency. And so that allows us to know how they're growing and, um, and then also how we can support them. And so it gives you things like I can statements so we know exactly how to support our students as they're becoming fully proficient in English. Um, thank you. Um, and so uh, uh, my view um, has a language awareness handbook um, that can be used, again, to support. Um, and with HMH into um, reading, uh, they have a desktop, uh, tabletop that you can flip and use um, during instruction. And so both of them provide that access point. Uh, next slide. Oh, right, we, this is the one that we did split into two. So this is where I was just talking about into reading. And so what you'll see is that second picture is their um, tabletop um, version of what you can use for the mini lessons for the specific skill taught in the core lesson. And so what's really important when we look at that tabletop um, guide is that it does align directly with the lesson that was taught in the core. Um, and you can see that they have several different ways to support learners throughout the entire program. And so there's just a few ways up there um, that we're showing. There's a read and respond journal. So there's several different ways that our multilingual learners are supported. Uh, next slide. 
And so when we talk about supports for differentiation, um, again, through equitable access, we're really looking at some of the different features that uh, HMH into reading and Savas My View provide. Uh, so into reading um, has a tabletop mini lesson um, and they actually have a, a couple different pathways. One is for our almost there, and one is ready for more. And so they're really acknowledging that uh, students are gonna be at different places in different lessons, and there's lots of options to differentiate. Um, and sometimes I know we say, oh, let's differentiate for the students that aren't there yet, but what um, HMH does is they do give for um, students that are ready for more, um, and they've surpassed already that, that lesson standard. Uh, in addition, Into Reading has a read and respond journal, um, and then take and teach lessons that align to uh, content area text um, that support that core theme for that module. In my view, literacy, uh, they have a My Focus Reader and a My Focus Intervention. And what they, their approach is, is they have taken that core text and they have scaffolded it into chunks. And so again, they, the students that need a little more support are getting it, but it ties directly back to core. Um, and then they do have small group instruction that they provide various different ways to help students access that lesson. And so there's uh, inquiry lessons, there's conferencing, they give some fluency lessons uh, to help support teachers in differentiating for students in providing equitable access. Uh, next slide. And so when we look at the gear at a glance, um, HMH into reading, their structure is in kindergarten. There's going to be nine uh, modules, and they are four weeks in length each. For grades one through five, uh, there are uh, they actually are three weeks in length, and there's 12 of them. What that equals out to is 180 days of core instruction. Modules 11 and 12 are standards that have been taught in one through 10. So that means there are there is some wiggle room with the, that number because 11 and 12 don't introduce any new standards but just reinforce the existing standards. Savas My View Literacy, their structure is the same K to five. You're gonna see six week units and there's five of them and that equals 150 days of instruction. Um, and the reason it isn't 180 is they have book clubs where they um, build in time for students to read novels. And so that's where you would get to your 180 days of instruction. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about pacing, um, because this question comes up a lot, um, we want to think about, well, what is it that we currently bake into our um, schedule that will stay the same? So we're not going to suggest any new uh, daily instructional pacing. We're going to keep the same one that we have. And what you'll see is that both programs have a little more in there than we currently have allocated for our instruction. And so what that means for us is that we will be making as an office some recommendations with whichever program we move forward with to say, here's how we're gonna account for those extra minutes um, and making sure that we prioritize what needs to be prioritized. And I'll give you an example. So maybe they have three types of writing throughout that module. We might say in this unit, we're gonna have you do th these two. And in the next unit, we're gonna have you do these two. And those are the types of uh, recommendations we'll make. But we just want to acknowledge, and we certainly got some teacher feedback around, there's too much to do. And we acknowledge that, and we will make sure that we prioritize and provide some guidance. Uh, next slide. And so one of the things that we did as we were gathering feedback, and Ms. Shea is actually gonna go really in deep into feedback in a little bit, uh, but one of the pieces of feedback that we did was we went out and looked at classrooms. And so we went and looked at uh, schools that were doing into reading and schools that were doing my view. And we were really looking at what the students were doing in terms of reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And so uh, what we found is, um, so, when you look at it, first of all, both in, um, both sets of data do indicate that our students are really interacting with text in multiple ways. Um, the second thing is when we look at it and we see that my view might be higher in some areas, one thing I would just like to offer anytime we look at data um, is that we've been piloting my view for a year. And so I think it's always important to remember that we just started uh, with into reading at the beginning of February, um, which means that our teachers are really still in a learning cycle. Um, and so 
Uh, the second thing I would say as we look at data is that it's one moment in time. So we walked in for 15 minutes and that's what we saw in that time. Um, however, what I would be encouraged about as we look at both of those is that students, whichever program they're working with, were really doing some literacy-based activities and that makes me happy to see. <laughs> Next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the assessments and some of the data from my view nationally. So curriculum-based assessments are a very big part of English language arts curriculum that we want end of the unit assessments so at the school level we can monitor um, student achievement and provide responsive instruction at that point of need. At the district level we use that data to inform our professional learning, to develop curriculum supports and resources that teachers may also need um, and also to target support to schools. We use that data to monitor. Um, one of the things you'll see is assessments in both into reading and my view are very similar. So you have multiple choice, you have extended response, and you have opportunities for writing prompts. Um, the, and all the areas are assessed of literacy. You also see one of the things that we found with HMH having the shorter units of the three weeks, there's an easy, there's a shorter, uh, a shorter instructional period. So teachers have, an, a, a t they have the data at more, at more use. Sorry, I've lost my word. Thank you. Yes, a quicker <laughs> cycle. Yes. A short, shorter cycle so they can teach and assess right at that point of need without waiting the six weeks and to do any kind of um, intervention. Next slide, please. Um, we've also, because we piloted my view for over a year, as Dr. Kraft shared with you, we've been able to collect data to compare BCPS curriculum unit assessments to my view unit assessments and what we've noticed from this data is that we are definitely in need of a research-based curriculum we need an evidence-based curriculum because there is such a difference between our BCPS legacy curriculum and my view right now in the units um, in the next slide shows the same um, and this one actually shows per of students scoring in the green and yellow achievement bands. Um, green means they're meeting grade level proficiency uh, at 70% or greater, and yellow is they're, they're approaching between 60 and 69%. And I just wanna make a quick note, Ms. Pumphrey, I know you'd asked for us to split the data, and we will. We just were at schools when we saw that today, so we have to get it, but we'll follow up and split that. So I just wanted to let you know we did get that feedback. Thanks. Sure. Another data point we've been able to collect on the next slide is um, with the, working with the Office of Social Studies. We work very closely with social studies and science. Um, could you do the next slide, please? Um, social studies has been piloting document-based questioning. Which One is more the slide, BBQ. please. Go ahead, yeah. keep going. There you and, go. Um, what the Office of Social Studies did was they started to compare and look at data assessments for grade four and five, where the document DBQ, document-based um, questioning, is being piloted. Um, and that really is a mini inquiry based project where students, it requires students to engage in reading multiple texts, writing, and really using critical thinking. There's a lot of analysis of text. So it really nicely aligns with ELA standards. Um, what we've done as we've noticed is, again, this data really is demonstrating to us the need for a curriculum that's going to provide those opportunities for students to engage in those project based inquiries as Dr. Kraft said earlier. Um, we also are gonna be able to really see student achievement with that evidence-based research and with um, social studies working together with the DBQ, especially for our fourth and fifth graders at this point. Next slide, please. The next two slides are gonna show some of the data that um, Savis shared with us about schools that had implemented my view from 2019 to 2021 and they used state assessment data they collected um, and you can see that there were eight states that they were able to study four on this slide and on the next slide you'll see two adi four additional states um, and all of those states were able to show an increase in student growth that were engaged in using the my view curriculum over that two-year period Next slide, please. Um, into reading, HMH also shared some national data with us. And what they did was they, they collected third grade data from um, 11,484 students and state data. Next slide, please. Can you forward the slide? Thank you. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and this data was third graders, 11,484 across multiple states and districts. Um, and what they found was there, were tw there was a 22% increase in students in to reading at or above grade level who had used it for one year and a 50% decrease in students performing below grade level. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, part of culturally relevant pedagogy is when we are looking at curriculum, we also have in conducted an audit to look at what are the criteria that make a curriculum culturally relevant. Um, and what you'll see is that from this audit, we know that both programs are going to need some support and resources to really meet our, our the high standards we've set as an office as in a county. This audit also reflects national work that we know has been conducted and that all publishers need to be, continue to work on being more culturally relevant with their um, stories, with the diversity. So we have to really make sure we're filling in with novels and all that all students are represented. Next slide, please. Um, along with the Office of Science and Social Studies, they actually were able to look at both programs and do a curricular audit um, to see how well they aligned currently with national, with the state standards for social studies and science. So you can see we, our offices continue to work together to make those connections because we know the more we can um, provide background knowledge for our students and integrate um, more meaningful learning for our students. Um, there is an artifact in your folder to look at that shows a more specifics about this audit we did, um, and that would be 5A. And then 5B and C show the different themes and modules in your um, folder that also show how both my view and into reading address science and social studies across their curricula. Next slide, please. Um, these next two slides show for us how um, some of the alignment to standards and rigor. HMH, this is um, author's purpose, specifically for grades one, three, and five anchor charts. And one of the things you'll see is consistency across grade levels, which is going to make vertical progressions and teaming, like te the same language is being used for skills. So we'll have consistency across grade levels, which is very important. The next slide shows my view um, author's purpose, and they approach, my view approaches it differently. They approach it from the genre that's been, instead of skills and strategies, they approach more from the genre and how author's purpose is across different genres. Um, and again, they have anchor charts for teachers at point of use and for students. Next slide, please. Oh, this is the old one. Well, the next two slides, if you just go ahead forward. But does this mean this is the old one? Yes, it is the old one. Because I'm just looking. And okay. next slide. <laughs> there you go. Can you click forward so that the slide animates? <laughs> one more. OK. Actually, can you go back one? I apologize. So I think we're using an old version of the presentation. So what I wanted to illustrate here, and because it may not have been clear in the PowerPoint before, this is a new, exciting um, uh, add on with HMH. Uh, you may recall as a board at a recent contracts committee meeting, um, it was shared that uh, HMH as a company purchased NWA, which is the company that um, administers the MAP assessment that we use in Baltimore County to measure growth. What's exciting about that with HMH is that um, systems that are using HMH as, a, as their core curriculum, they're now able to integrate directly with NWA. Um, and so what that means is that teachers would be able to use a report from MAP with RIT scores, and then if you click ahead one, directly align to the curriculum. So this is important because it allows for teachers to take data around progress. One of the things that has been a challenge as a system is what do I do with a RIT score? How do I make that meaningful in terms of action in the classroom? Um, because of that um, acquisition and HMH now having both, they're able to integrate in real time so that teachers will be able to have a crosswalk that tells them for students scoring in this band of a RIT score, here are the instructional resources um, that you should use to support them. It also will give us as a system um, the backwards map. So students who scored the highest RIT scores, these are the resources that the teachers were utilizing so that we can start to see a much stronger connection between classroom instruction and those measures of progress, which as you know, um, is really the ball game, right? That's what you're trying to do with those growth measures. So that's unique to HMH, so we wanted to share that piece. Um, so if you go to the next slide, part of the uh, core belief, besides responsive instruction, you can click one more, please. Um, and then, I don't know, Dr. Kraft, can you work with um, Ms. Cox to switch out the PowerPoint just while I talk about this piece? Thank you so much. Um, so both uh, companies, we wanted to talk about professional learning. As a board already, uh, and as a new board, you've already um, 
recognize the critical role of professional learning. Both products have different approaches to job embedded professional learning. For both products, uh, we have been fortunate to have uh, strong support from vendors around um, professional learning and for um, job embedded coaching. And then on this slide, it kind of details the different way that teachers can utilize resources for on demand, um, as well as I already referenced some of that um, data resources. The piece that's really important to hear about is how each of these um, products support professional learning communities and how teachers work together to use assessment data to plan. Um, Ms. Pumphrey, one of the questions that you sent that I can answer in real time is about who gets trained. So um, with a purchase of a new ELA curriculum, we will train everybody. So we train administrators, principals, and assistant principals. We train reading specialists, staff development teachers, ESOL teachers, special educators, classroom teachers, and then also paraeducators that support the classroom teachers. Um, we basically, once we have a contract, uh, we begin and then we just do it really forever and ever. And so we do it in, in various different modules. We've gotten a lot of feedback for both pilots about the formats of professional development that work best for teachers. Um, we also, with the new registration system, have a much better way of tracking who actually completed professional development because that has historically also been a challenge. As a system that hires upwards of 900 new teachers every year, it's important that we're able to monitor that as we hire new hires or as um, teachers change grade levels, that we ha have a way of partnering with our schools to monitor who's um, receiving that training. So I know that was a question you asked. I wanted to build that in. Um, what's reflected on this slide is just the different ways that both products support planning. And so um, the last, uh, the second and last slide that we have here as they're transitioning was really about the way we gathered feedback. So up till now, the body of evidence that we've shared has really just been about resource to resource and comparing the different components of how they meet um, the needs of us as a system. But we are not just a paper a pencil organization. We're largely a people organization. And when we talk about evidence-based research, the research that's really clear uh, across education is that the most important factor is the teacher. And that uh, no matter what I buy, it has to be about the teacher's implementation and the professional learning and feedback from teacher. So while we've um, paced out this curricula, kind of showing each component or criteria that we used, uh, we actually weight the feedback from teachers and administrators at about a 10x because they are by far the most important factor in what happens in the classroom and ultimately the achievement for students. So what we've just shared with you, uh, that we were, the survey was still open at the time that we were um, gathering for, for posting, um, but we certainly can add um, with Dr. McComas's position um, after. We wanted you to see the feedback, and I'm going to give you a moment to look through. This feedback that you're looking at specifically is about a survey. We had over 300 responses in the survey. We also did classroom visits, multiple focus groups. Um, we also spoke with other districts that are using uh, HMH in Maryland, um, and then national districts using HMH and Savas. Um, and then we also had an opportunity, we partner with TABCO. There's a specific committee, the Curriculum Instruction and Climate Group, that meets with me every month. They actually did their own survey with teachers. Um, I know we often talk about, are teachers gonna tell us the truth? Um, they do. <laughs> I believe they do tell us um, the truth. But we were grateful to partner with TABCO because it's another avenue outside of us to get feedback. Um, as you can see in the feedback in front of you, it was overwhelming that teachers preferred HMH. They talk specifically about the accessibility, the ease of planning, the ability to meet the needs of their students, um, and to really uh, specifically talk about um, how it's implemented in the classroom. Um, and again, given that the amount of time they had to learn HMH was much shorter, that is significant. Um, that it was across the board in grade levels. Initially, it was loudest amongst our primary teachers. They felt very strongly around HMH and support of our youngest learners. However, I will say over time, that even included our intermediate teachers, that they were talking about that. Um, many of our intermediate teachers, um, because there are some that preferred my view, um, which you'll see re reflected, um, and many identified th some of the aspects we already illustrated. So aspects that they really favored about my view were already reflected in some of the data we shared, and that includes things like the content area integration, 
uh, the rigor of some of the writing and the research. So a lot of our intermediate teachers did express that that was a preference in my view because of their goal to get our students ready for those secondary grades. What was very interesting is, you know, we did have some schools and some teachers that were incredibly brave um, and dedicated and did both. So we gave them a choice uh, in February if they had been piloting my view and they wanted to take on the task of switching to HMH, um, that they could do that. 100% um, of the teachers that responded that had done both chose HMH that had the opportunity to do my view um, and HMH chose HMH. Um, so at this point, and we've certainly given you a lot of information, we want you to ask questions, but um, our recommendation is that we go with our teachers. We believe that HMH Bye, um, is, the pres is the product that we should use moving forward. Um, as I said, both are evidence-based, both received the highest rating, both have strong elements of instruction. Um, but it's incredibly clear to us that our teachers have used their voice as well as their um, administrators and reading specialists. Um, and we need our teachers. We need our teachers to feel that their voice matters. And we believe that uh, HMH um, as a core curriculum will allow us to meet the needs of our students um, and also meet the needs of our teachers. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it. Dr. McComas, I certainly want to send it back to you if there's anything you want to add. And then certainly we'll I think I just like, would like to thank the team for the extensive uh, work um, to bring forward to our, our committee here um, as much um, information for us to look at and discuss um, because this is a, such a monumental decision for our children. So I'll just turn it back over. I think the sooner we get the Q&A, the better. Here we are. Right. <laughs> okay. So you, we'll, we can start with questions. Um, looking at what you want to start, Mr. <laughs> I, I'm I'm okay, Miss Pomfrey. You want to start? We can just okay, right? We can do one one for one. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm trying to get back to the slide I wanted to reference. I think it was thirteen. Okay, that? sorry. Okay. So uh, looking at slides 15 and 16, I believe this, uh, these are, I think this is data that the, um, that Savas shared with you and not what you produced. It, it just, the, the graph is um, strange to me because the different states are showing different numbers on the left axis. So one is showing zero to 40%. So the comparisons side to side is not really a comparison, if that makes sense. Yes. yes. And it, it, it was something given to us and just, it was a PDF. Okay. Yeah. You sort of have to look at each individual state and the percentage of growth that they're reflecting and not look state compared. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. That was just. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, some of these, uh, honestly, some of these percentages, but this, we're looking at my view, so I guess maybe I don't need to <laughs> compliment, but I mean, 1% growth is really not enough to get our students where they need to be. Right. At we, all. Not even close. Right. Right, and, and again, in the spirit of full transparency, we want to bring everything forward yeah. for consideration. I, I so appreciate that. Because um, I, there's, there's nothing, there's no need to be other than transparent, mm -hmm. right? And so to we lay it all out yeah. for the public and for the discussion, that's why it's, it's great that you raised the question. Or yeah, the, 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 the one thing I will offer too is that the time frame is a challenge. I know we're tired of saying, but 2020, but I do think that there, um, sometimes 1% is also recouping loss and still gaining 1%. So I recognize we need to grow faster than that, and we certainly agree with that. Um, but we've also seen grade levels in our system that we're declining, you know, and, and so part of our effort is we absolutely need to not decline <laughs> and then make steady and then rapid and accelerated growth um, to close that gap. So that's going to be critically important for us as well. And I agree with you. And some of, my, mm -hmm. some of the research I've done on my own, I've, I've you know, I've read that it's going to take time. It's not something sure. that's going to happen overnight. But we do need to. We need to move. It's obvious that we need to move yes, as quickly as possible. Sure. Um, and I do appreciate that you took the teachers. I, I can say all the schools that I visited, and a, and a couple were doing both pilot, were using both pilots. 
it was, I was hoping you would say that because that's what I observed. <laughs> so I wanted to, make, you know, I'd yeah. like to see that um, connection, but it was overwhelmingly, um, you know, and also teachers that I know personally who reached out to me yeah. um, were overwhelmingly in support of um, into reading c- yeah. um, compared to my view. Um, we really do listen. <laughs> we really I do. I know, but it's nice we to actually, really do. Uh, you know, I'm new to this. Sure. It's nice for me I know. to visit. It's good when we're on the same page and getting, <laughs> I appreciate it that nice very me, much. It's nice for me to visit, and I think I was um, fortunate enough to be able to visit many schools that were piloting. Wonderful. I appreciate um, and that. And just to see that in action, so that was nice. Um, and then uh, my other question regarding a slide is for 18, mm-hmm. um, regarding the culturally responsi- responsive curricula. Yes. Where, what is your, what was your resource for this? Um, so I'll start, and then I'll certainly invite Dr. Kraft. We use a culturally responsive scorecard published by NYU Steinhardt um, that identifies a criteria for, it actually was published with the intent for districts and families um, and even parents to do an audit um, using a uh, rubric tool that they produce. So I don't know if Dr. Kraft, you want to add to that. Uh, and so this particular audit was done um, uh, by for someone's capstone. So Loyola University has a Master's of Curriculum Instruction in Social Justice. And, um, and so as part of her capstone project, she was actually uh, a reading specialist at a school that was doing both. Um, and so she wanted to look at the cultural responsiveness. So uh, like Ms. Shea said, we already use this rubric in our office. And so she was able to take that same rubric and use it um, looking at both um, programs. If I may, could we have the team kind of uh, explain what cultural responsiveness is, uh, just for the general public sure. who may be watching? Um, So you can see on the left-hand side of the two graphs that there's a number of components of the um, particular scorecard that we use. Um, It talks about author diversity, uh, specifically that uh, stories are told from an author who is from the population of the culture that they're purporting to write about. It also talks about uh, character and subject diversity. Representation is also about making sure that representation is from an asset-based mindset. So you don't want to see um, particular stereotypes aligned either with gender or race or ethnic background that um, a particular race is only pictured in a city or a particular race is only pictured living on a farm or a particular occupation is only occupied by men or by women. Um, So it talks about both the test um, and also what students are asked to do with that. So when it talks about social justice orientation, um, that's things that are asking students to think for themselves, opportunities for students to exercise uh, student voice, agency, and advocacy rather than just uh, repeating back um, or kind of regurgitating um, facts. And then there's also a component that talks about, um, on the right-hand side, um, you can see that um, there is, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, my slide's all over the place. Um, Some of the other pieces is just within the teacher materials. And, And this is why it's really important to note the publishing world is very far behind in this. Um, Some of the statistics about children's publishing, I think at the last offset, it was like 80% of children's books feature animals (laughs) or a character that is white. And so um, some of it is just flat representation, but then you have to look deeper than that and think about some of those stereotypes I already referenced. But then it's also about the teacher materials, including opportunities for teachers to reflect that cultural competence about how to use those materials to engage student in a way that is um, culturally affirming. And so that can include specific question prompts, um, that can include opportunities for for teachers to engage in discussion. Where we are now, just really nationally as a publishing industry and with curriculum, it doesn't exist in the way that it needs to in curriculum, which is part of why we are so committed in partnership with our equity office in investing in our teachers so that whatever material we're, we're putting in front of students, and it is getting better, they are improving in the publishing world in the opportunities for more diverse authors, more diverse characters, different contexts. Uh, they are not there yet in terms of the teacher margins, the notes, and some of those opportunities for student voice, and that's where professional learning um, and support for teachers is really critical And until the publishing world catches up. Um, Um, And until we are in a position to be able to say uh, it's right in there, we have to do a both and. We have to identify a core resource and continue to develop that capacity for our teachers. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I I just have a question. When I as I look at the the comments on the right. 
the teacher survey, thank you. Um, a lot of the, the, I don't want to say negative, what was the word you used? Right. Challenges. <laughs> really show evidence of low expectations. Yes. Um, so my concern is how are we going to make sure that, I mean, I know this is only a sample of people, but it's pervasive throughout a lot of the, the criticism is that it's too hard or too much. So we'll get a really good series in place with high expectations and the level of rigor and aligned to the standards, but yet if teachers feel it's too difficult, we're not gonna see the results that we need. So how will we combat that? It's, it's a great uh, question and, and it's a consistent aspect. We, often, we talked uh, earlier this morning about what if we had brought this series to teachers before, right, in the before times? Because part of what teachers are responding to that does reflect low expectation is still a byproduct of where we've been in the last two years. Um, what we have to do, regardless of the series, is continue to do professional learning for teachers and administrators around the rigor of the standards. Teachers need feedback, in, so we have to pour into our reading specialists and our um, administrators as well. Um, that, and that has been a focus with our partnership with the Department of Schools in our instructional rounds. What we found, and we're starting to see this happening in Bridges, when we pour into teachers' understanding of the depth of rigor of the standard, when we pour into administrators and reading specialists so they truly understand the expectations, then when they look at the curriculum, they look at it completely differently because now it makes sense why I'm having students build the capacity this way, why I'm asking students to plan out a conversation before they engage in discourse, why I'm expecting kindergartners to write a paragraph and not just a fill-in-the-blank sentence. Without that understanding, the curriculum just feels too hard. Some of the other piece that the teachers gave us feedback about my view is that not only is it really challenging for where students are, the design of how it's put together made it harder for teachers to plan. And that was, it was a double whammy. So not only was it increasing the rigor of what they were gonna expect of students, but teachers didn't feel like it was really that approachable. And so combating with the expectation of um, students, we also have to remember we're in a teacher shortage. We're hiring more and more non-tenured teachers. We're hiring, we have more long-term subs, vacancies that, I mean, it's almost May and we have schools that are still holding vacancies. HMH was much more accessible for teachers and so it was much more something that an administrator could hand to a new teacher and say, start here as I continue to build your capacity through professional learning around the rigor of the standards. Um, and then the last piece I would say is it's about, again, going back to that leadership. Um, we need our principals to be able to, in informal visits with classrooms, give feedback aligned to that rigor of the standards so that the teachers, not in a gotcha kind of way, have that understanding of how they continue to grow as they learn those materials. So it has to come hand in hand, I think. Thanks. I mean, that, you know, my concern is that your office is um, going to be down small are going to be down people next year and to me the professional development is as important as really the selection of, of, of the series yep. so we're just going to have to think through that lens as a board is how are we going to support and try to get you more support yes. to make sure that our teachers truly understand how to implement it or it's it's just not going to yield the results it'd been interesting you know it, i thought it was interesting they gave you the one percent um, that the other company gave you that 1% growth, you know, that they even gave that. The right. question is, I would have loved to see what did your professional development look like compared right. to some of the counties that are systems. But um, but thank you for that. That's just a, a, a real concern because it's sure. only as good as the teachers standing right. in front of it. We this, agree, which is why the overwhelming feedback really informed our, you know, decision. recommendation. Ms. Dominowski, do you have a, another question? Um, how much... Uh, I guess, time are we going to be giving our teachers with this program before they are expected to implement it in the classroom? Great question. So part of it depends on the contract committee. <laughs> I have to put that plug in because this, the, the, the sooner I get it, when we finish here, the next step is the contracts, and the sooner we have the contract, we could start even before they leave school. Um, we have made available things like uh, some of the program guides that you saw. So teachers are getting, we've done uh, drop-in sessions for both programs, so teachers be have familiarity. We will do professional development throughout the summer and then again in return in August and then throughout next year. Um, what we've talked in partnership with um, TABCO and with administrators and with teachers, um, oftentimes when we adopt something new like this, um, we um, give teachers grace. And so we, we don't let them use a different curriculum in the first marking period, but we don't have them have their formal observation. We don't have their evaluation based on that because we want to make sure the message is we all need to invest 
trust in learning. We all need to be in a supportive stance of growth and capacity. And our elementary teachers, by and large, teach lots of things. So we can, you know, let's observe them in health or math or science for a bit while they get used to that. Um, but our goal would be to begin professional development as soon as we have that contract approval and then just continue offering it both before they leave in June, throughout the summer, and then uh, all through next year. I'm sorry, what? For the rest of our lives, yes. <laughs> that is true. For the rest of our lives. Um, just to give you some feedback on sure. that, I, I did hear from some teachers who saw that you, you were offering both the MyView and the HMA. Am I saying that right? HMH. HMH. Mm -hmm. um, and saying, like, here, work with both of these. Tell us what, like, and they were like, well, I don't want to waste wanna my time yeah. with the one that we're not going to yeah. use. Yeah, it's fair. It's yeah. definitely fair. Yeah. And, and you know, if we, if we go back in time, this timing has been a challenge, right? And I know this is a new board, but you can go back through the history and see this is not ideal timing for any of us <laughs> in terms of, of how this went. So we're just going to continue to give grace and work with teachers. Um, we, we've been really clear and, and in close partnership with, uh, like I said, the TAPCO Curriculum Instruction Climate Committee as well as the leadership uh, just to make sure that the stance is our kids need this. We need to be all hands on deck and support that. And then uh, one comment I had, I loved the articulation videos that are included in the HMH. I, I think yeah. that's a huge it's great. for those kids. It's yeah. great. Especially, I wish it was, had been around when we, they had to wear the masks. And, and I know, that would have been a I great think. resource for our teachers. You're exactly right, because that was a challenge. Yes. Um, and my only, I did, uh, what, can you give me an example of a social justice orientation as far as yeah, like a sure. kindergarten level and then a third grade level. Sure. So actually, there was just an, a really great example. I don't know if you follow the county executive on Twitter, um, but there was a student at Featherbed Lane who spoke at a meeting and said there was a pothole and it wasn't right. The kids could get dropped off and kids could get hurt. And so having a, instead of having a writing project be what's your favorite candy, having students write a project that's about social justice, about looking out for others, about making sure that, um, but in a developmentally appropriate way, right? So it could be having kindergarten advocate for a playground where their friend who's in a wheelchair can access the playground. Mm -hmm. um, so it's taking the concept of social justice orientation and applying it in varying levels that are appropriate at that age level. And kids get it. You know, they, the kids really get um, very passionate because the relevance is so powerful. Um, I saw another one where first graders wanted to ride their bike to school and they got a bike ride. So all of those are actually examples where kids are doing this before we put it in the curriculum. Um, so, so that's an example of what that means. Thank you. Sure. Mrs. Hahn, do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. Um, I really appreciate you go you going into depth on those example of social justice orientations because when I visited elementary schools, they told me that they were upset that um, it wasn't fair that you know people in the community were just bringing their dogs and kids could be allergic to their dogs or mm -hmm. scared of dogs. And they were like, well, how are we supposed to just play on the playground if there are dogs everywhere and we don't know these people? Right. Um, and you know, they were having like a really in-depth conversation. Passionate. And then they wrote a letter about it and it was so <laughs> wonderful. Um, so it's it's really good to see um, the implementation of, of social justice is, is so much about just interacting with your community and that engagement. Um, and with that, like, I do want to touch back on this culturally responsive audit. Mm -hmm. um, so as like the total scoring, we're seeing my view be a little bit more culturally responsive. But we like I'm also in agreement that HMH is definitely like the stronger um, curriculum for our teachers and thus for our students. Okay. Um, so how can we like supplement for you guys um, the, you know, supporting HMH, but also ensuring that we're filling in those gaps with cultural responsiveness and ensuring that our students are engaged with culturally responsive discussions? Great question. I'm going to, um, do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? Okay. Um, so the good news is we have already invested in um, culturally responsive texts that we have purchased um, for exactly that reason. We've been doing professional learning with teachers and our reading specialists. So schools already have text sets that they use for um, fun reading as part of their classroom libraries, but that we were strategic in investing in making sure they had um, supplements to authors where we saw gaps. As the office mentioned, they had already been doing an audit themselves. Um, we do the same thing with our approach with some of our novels. So when we identify novels um, for the elementary grades, uh, whether it's um, read alouds for teachers in the primary grades or, or novels, we're very intentional about filling in those gaps that we've identified in a published curricula. So those are two ways that we're already poised um, that we do it. So I certainly invite my colleagues to offer anything else. Uh, so, Ms. Shea already covered the uh, text sets that we do, the culture responsive text sets. To add on to that, 
what our work this summer will be is to align the text sets with the modular themes and so that we can tell teachers these books would be good for here. But also what you're seeing really is um, the, the whole score. We have to go down and say why did it not score that high because it could be several different identities. So right now you're just kind of seeing that, that number but for us what we have to look at is who wasn't represented or how were they represented or how weren't they represented and then that's the work that we do through those culturally responsive text sets, through the novels that we use. And our novels that we actually already have in schools, we have been very intentional in, in selecting them to make sure that we are representing a wide range of identities in those texts. And so now our work is to say, how do we connect it to the, the program so that we can ensure that everybody sees themselves throughout the units. And so that it will be our next step is to really dig into that data and use it um, to fill in where the gaps currently are. Thank you. And I just have um, one question, just going back to this um, idea of, of high expectations and dealing with that um, post-pandemic, but also understanding that high expectations do um, on occasion and on many occasion um, drive positive student outcomes. Um, so how are we, so I know we talk a lot about professional learning and understanding that, you know, we want our teachers to have high expectations, but we also have to understand that morale and mm -hmm. um, just the overall understanding of you know post-pandemic learning is we're also just trying not to regress mm -hmm. um, and reach back to this like point of equilibrium. So my question really is just about how we can use HMH and, and supplement it with the resources that we need to just to get back to this equilibrium point mm -hmm. so that we can begin to shift this idea of morale into high expectations and thus student success. One thing, and it's a great question because um, there, there's, you know, there's just so much, right? There's people have had so much on their plate. One thing that there's a resource in HMH that one of the teachers pointed out to me that I think helps, which is they include exemplars of student work. And so what's been really powerful for the teachers is to see this is what you can expect of a first grade writer, right? This is some other first grader somewhere in the country wrote this. Sometimes seeing it through that lens helps us to get to that equilibrium, okay? Because if any first grader can write like this, my first graders can write like this. And that starts the conversation about beliefs and about having those high expectations, but comes from a place where it's more goal setting and not punitive. Because sometimes what we see is, um, our teachers love our students into low expectations. And so sometimes a culture of caring for children and everything they've been through um, can have a counter impact on expectations. And all the research supports that actually the best way to show your students you love them is to have high expectations and be that warm demander. Um, but our teachers do it out of love and care and concern. Sometimes they over scaffold because they know the child's story. What we wanna try to get back to is using like a specific curricular resource like an exemplar gets to say, I'm still gonna scaffold for you, but this is the target because if any first grader can write this way, I know you can. I'm gonna give you the scaffolds and supports you need because of everything else you've had going on. We haven't had that. We haven't had that space of, and so everyone has, um, sort of define for themselves what they believe is acceptable. So we'll hear from teachers in one school that will say, you know, I've had teachers say to me, you know, this expects my kindergartners to write a paragraph. And I'll say, yeah, me too. Like, I think they can, I know they can. And I'll say to the teachers, like when we have an opportunity to plan, well, let's try, you know, let's see. Um, and, and more often than not, the kids can. And the teacher's not doing it because they are trying to harm kids. They're doing it from a place of love and care and wanting kids to be successful. So I think part of it is recalibrating what is the actual expectation of the core standard? And then what happens when we give kids the opportunity? And then when they can't, how do we scaffold so that the next time we present that opportunity, they're even more successful? And I, I think that there are curricular resources in addition to that professional learning. Um, and then also bringing teachers together. Having this core resource that we're, it's an opportunity to reset and recalibrate. When it's, although it's gonna be a huge lift with a smaller crew, um, it is an opportunity to bring people together, right? And let teachers co-plan across schools, bring third grade teachers together in a community, in a feeder pattern. Mm -hmm. That also helps to change those expectations because when they hear it from a colleague or they see another class or they get to visit another class, that's a really powerful way to help shift some of that too. And I'm just going to add on Ms. Shea. Mm -hmm. Ms. Hassan, is such a good question. And so everything that Ms. Shea said, and I wanted to point out two things that Dr. Wolf and Ms. Shea said during the presentation. So 
Dr. Wolf talked about those three-week modules, and so that provides an opportunity to give more frequent um, um, feedback and so when students aren't meeting standard then we have a chance to then say okay let's look at that next unit in addition Ms. Shea talked about the NWA map scores and really um, making these personalized pathways within the platform for students at point of need and so the more we have just-in-time support the more that it feels like we can do it when when too much time goes by I think that that is sometimes how the expectations lower because it becomes unmanageable Manageable. And so then we were just like, okay, well, we can get to here, but we can't get to here. And so what that allows is some of the features of the program will allow us to keep those high expectations, but give the supports that not only uh, students need, but teachers need to keep the rigor of the standard at the level of that grade level. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm sorry, one last question. Um, I just wanted to, I know you guys touched on um, the curriculum in response to English language learners. Um, I just like, could you guys possibly go a little bit into more depth on that and to how HME supports um, our students who are either transitioning from ELL and in, back into um, this like full HMH curriculum um, and also for students who are like, who are um, more focused on, yeah. you know, building those English language skills. Sure, great question. So I'm gonna um, pull up and see what's, I don't know what slide number it'll be on which presentation, but HMH has a variety of resources that they build in specifically for multilingual learners. Um, first, they start with, um, there's something in the whole group lesson support that's called a, um, a text x-ray. And what that does as an, imagine an x-ray kind of overlaying, pulling out um, just those particular areas of the body that you're trying to image. The text x-ray identifies the academic vocabulary and the concept vocabulary that's critical for English language learners to know to build that concept background. Um, then of course they have daily mini small group lessons so the goal is to have all of our multilingual learners included with their um, classmates so that they have those models of support but then they have that um, specific support through those small group mini lessons. Um, they also have writing scaffolds so we do a lot in our training with uh, Sheltered Instruction Observation Protocol or SIOP about uh, a language objective so we, um, in our lesson plan template, actually, we talk about having a content objective and a language objective. And one of the ways that scaffolds for our multilingual learners is um, it's one thing for me to learn the content, but I also need to learn the language to talk and write about that content. And so some of those are built in as scaffolds in the curriculum, both at point of use for teachers, like in the margins um, while they're reading, but then also as supplemental resources. Um, this team knows it way better than I do, but they're good teachers, so I'm gonna ask them if they have anything they wanna add. Uh, one of the resources that HMH has that came across loud and clear in our survey and when we visited classrooms is they have these beautiful picture cards to go with the main vocabulary for each module that's around the theme. So the, there's, and there's language on the back for instruction for the teacher to use to actually introduce those words, have students use those words in multiple different ways. So there's multi-sensory built in, and then that visual is there, which is a excellent support for our English language learners that then they can begin to use that vocabulary in their writing and in their speaking. Ms. Pumphrey, do you have any other questions? How did you know? <laughs> I, was just, I was just going around. Sorry to circle it around again. Um, I, going back to professional development. Sure. Um, when we attended the national, the board, some board members attended the um, national board conference. Um, I went to a science of reading um, workshop, which was wonderful. And many of the things that you spoke about here w was referenced um, at that workshop, which was wonderful. <laughs> That's good. It reinforced my <laughs> questions. Uh -huh. um, but they did, they did talk about implementation and how mm -hmm. important it was. Um, but sure. they mentioned that um, administrators should be trained first. Mm -hmm. So uh, do we have our process for that? And will that happen? Um, and as part of that, um, I think there's a second part. Well, how about I answer the first part and give you a chance to. Thank you. So, yeah, sure. So, yes, the, the great news and, and our poor administrators, um, it sometimes is a challenge too, is that they're 12 months. So we can hit the ground running with our principals and assistant principals in the summer. So that will be one of the first starting points that we will offer. And we'll offer multiple sessions so that they can take vacation because they need that too. Um, because we want them to be poised to support their teachers. We agree that leadership having an understanding of the program, that's some of the feedback that our administrators have given us in the pilot is that the more they know, the more they're in a position to give feedback and 
Um, the other piece that we did at a principals meeting the last two months, we offered drop-in sessions for principals to get ahead and to get a sneak preview of both products and to hear from colleagues. So one of the things that's gonna be really critical is having principals who piloted HMH and have already seen and kind of been sort of our forward ops, if you will, uh, help support our professional learning for their colleagues so that they're thinking through what does an administrator need to know about this uh, program in order to best lead and, and support the work. So that's a part of our planning team. Anything you want to add? No, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we're also offering letters for administrators over yes. the summer, and letters is the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, which is all about how the brain learns to read and why some children struggle with learning to read. And uh, HMH has actually developed um, an overlay of how letters and HMH into work reading together. work together. Um, and so that will also be a really strong piece when you talk about the science of reading is understanding, well, how do these pieces show up in the program? And so those will happen in tandem. And the only thing I would happen is add is that it will be an ongoing cycle um, as we continue to deepen our knowledge. And so it's not a one and done, but rather this continuous process of providing uh, what everyone needs to keep moving us forward. Thank you, and I actually think the second question is no is moot because it talked about selling the curriculum to the teachers first, mm -hmm. and I'm by choosing uh, um, into reading. I think yeah. um, now I will say into consideration. I, I have disappointed some teachers tonight because there are some my view devotees that I'm going to have to pry the books out of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, they are very passionate and committed, and not for nothing have worked for a year on something and have invested a year of their professional experience. And I don't take that lightly because the system needs teachers like that. That's a huge lift. Um, so we are gonna have some work to do. Um, they're professionals, they'll come around, but there there are gonna be some teachers who feel like we chose wrong. You know, there's a moment for us that we're like, we're gonna make 50% of that. <laughs> but that's leadership, right? That, that happens. So um, I am sensitive to that. But what we did, um, what we're starting to do is asking some of our folks that, vote, that did both, that clearly articulated a preference for HMH to help tell me why. Because they're the ones that can sell to their colleagues. I've done both. And here's why I think this one will be better. And to show the crosswalk of how there are similarities. There are features that teachers loved about my view. We just have to help them see where that exists in the new curriculum. So that will still be a part of the selling, uh, less so because of the, the feedback with HMH, but it's still a thing that we're really mindful of. If I may, Ms. Pumphrey, you also had um, asked uh, in your email about um, accountability, right? Like who is it that helps us ensure that our teachers are implementing the things that we purchase as a system? You know, our team works to provide, we do the research, identify what are the right products, um, to address the needs of our students. We help support uh, that professional development. But as you know, you visit schools all the time and thank you for doing that. That day in and day out is really where our school leadership comes in. Um, and so that's why, to your point, it's so important to support our, the capacity around our school leadership to be able to go into those classrooms and see that our teachers are implementing the things that we're asking them to do and identifying uh, where they may need additional support, right? And, and working hand in hand with our team because we're covering all 112 elementary schools, right? But they're the boots on the ground in each school who's really holding holding us all as a system to the fidelity of implementation. So I hope I answered that question for you. So. Yes, I just, and it, it's separate from here, you know this, but I have, um, I have strong feelings about our professional development, making sure that in, with our phonics um, instruction that it's being implemented properly. Mm -hmm. I have big concerns about that. And so when we're looking at a $10 million contract, um, although it's not for the phonics open court, right. um, if we have issues with professional development with open court and seeing that progress the way it should, um, my concern is that you know that's gonna roll over to this new curriculum. So that's why I ask those questions and address those yeah. issues. So. Um, we agree. We we would love to do nothing but professional development all day long <laughs> with all 9,000 teachers. Uh, trust me. Uh, because we believe in the power of professional development. We continue as a system to, to have many challenges, right, to make sure that we, and professional development, to Dr. Kraft's point, is never finished, right? It's never finished for a lot of reasons. One, we continue through the science of learning to understand and learn more about how the brain mm -hmm. acquires literacy skills. So we're, one, the field itself is always progressing. Two, there's always um, 
shift in, in uh, teacher and leadership populations, right? Teachers retire, new teachers come into the profession. So there's never a moment in time where you can say, I have 100% of the people trained and we're done, right? So I just offer that. The other thing that's always challenging, and I, and I think if, if the team could speak to like letters as just an example, I know we're here talking about HMH, but letters is I think a great example of the amount of time needed to really do that well, and then the trade-off, right, between how do we actually have access to our adults who we need to help them learn and grow, and the trade-off of pulling them away from students at the same time. In my dream world, our teachers would be 12-month employees. And just like the principals, I could say, okay, we're going, you know, really deep all summer long on name it, whatever phonics, if it's, you know, comprehension, whatever the case may be. But it, it is truly an ongoing challenge for us. I think there are some other school systems that have interesting things in their master's agree master agreements mm -hmm. that help support that that we don't currently have. So I just offer that as... Um, our challenge is how do we eliminate those barriers, right? Because if we offer things after school, some people can make it. Some people need to go pick up their own child after school. Some people are working on master's degrees. So, um, so either we pull them during the day, in which case we're pulling them from children and we're putting a substitute in there. We ask them to stay after school, and they may or may not be able to do it. We offer it through the summer. So please, I just offer that to you to say, we agree. <laughs> we are with you on that. Um, and our ongoing community uh, practice challenge is how do we eliminate those barriers and, and provide the adults the, the time that they need to learn and grow so that when they are with students, it's optimizing the time. So I'll get off my soapbox, but I just want you to know we are right there with you on it. <laughs> so I know this is a, a huge decision and everything, but I also am mindful of the time, and I know, um, yeah. so it's, we got about seven minutes before six. Ms. Dominowski, did you have any other questions that you want to ask? No? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to, okay, then, when you, you said weed in the beginning, the alignment, was that, which series was that for? Both. 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 Because what's, I don't know if it, what is really encouraging also is that weed is aligned to it, maps aligned to it, now you're saying letters is aligned to it. So I mean I really think that isn't a great not selling point, but but it Important really factor. consideration. It, yep. Yeah, it's really and that our teachers know all those pieces because that's the you know, we don't have that. We always talk about the silos. So yep. um so I'm just so excited to see that all those pieces would come together. So any other burning questions, Ms. Pumphrey? One more okay. more of a contractual question. Okay. Um do we have to do this for 10 years? And the oh, reason I asked that it's is... It's not 10 years. Oh, not it, 10 years. 10 million. Five. Five, five years, sorry. <laughs> I meant five years, 10 million. <laughs> sorry. No, no, go ahead. Um, do we have to do this for five years? And the reason I'm asking is, uh, are we able to... I mean, we piloted this for a short amount of time, as you know. Sure. Um, so that we can see some data that it's actually working. Yeah. So I'm going to answer that in two ways. Um, one is, of course, no, we don't have to do anything. But oftentimes, then that will significantly impact the price. Um, so I'm not going to get into those details because I'm not procurement. But I can tell you from my experience, sometimes that's actually fiscally not wise to do that. But what I want to assure you in is having a five-year contract does not mean that if we, we always retain the right that if it is not working to, to go back to that vendor. We're not locked in. The other thing I will offer is that rolling out an implementation takes time. So if you did something like a three-year contract, I want to go back to Ms. Dominowski sharing very valid feedback from teachers. Teachers might get to year 1.6 before they really feel like they got it going, and I'm starting to do an RFI to replace it because my contracts. So there is a moment where you also have to think about, is that realistic? I'd be calling on people to pilot something new in year 1.8 to get ahead of that expiration. So I just offer that for context. The short answer is no. We can, I mean, certainly in the contracts committee, that's certainly something that you know, at the board's discretion can be brought up. But I just wanted to raise those two considerations for your um, thinking about we're never locked in. It's really a matter of trying to have competitive pricing, to have a vision and a plan for schools so that we can say to schools, it's worth your time in investing in it because we're going to stick with this for a bit. Um, but we're certainly, that that's always a consideration that you can discuss. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so... At 556, we're doing good. <laughs> so, okay, I gotta get the names right. So may I have a motion to move H, M, oh no, 
Yes, I'm doing right. Okay. <laughs> may I have a <laughs> may I have a motion um, to approve HMH um, into reading contract? So moved, Dominowski. Do I have a second? Second, Hassan. Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Y'all go on drum roll too. <laughs> <laughs> Three years in the making. All right, Miss Lichter. Um, yes. Miss Pumphrey. This was difficult for me, <laughs> but yes. Thank you. Miss Dominowski. Yes. Miss Hassan. Yes. Thank you. So motion passes, and you may move HMH into reading to the contract committee. So, um, and thank you. I, I know how much work this is. I know how much work it's going to be. If you, <laughs> I, if you think you've worked a lot so far, we're <laughs> right. Hold on. Um, we ain't seen nothing yet. Right. right. Um, and then as a board, we need to find ways to support thank you, you and to be able to advocate for it um, and the reasons why we're excited about it and then what can we do to support because the professional learning I think is our our your concern, your concern, and, and our concern also. So um, we're with you there. So thank you, thank you. And oh, I got to go back to my script, but I think I say something like, <coughs> "Is there any further business?" Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> since there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Um, oh, but one uh, final thing. So I know we met in person because we thought we were going to spend time looking at the materials, and we really haven't. But I do think it was a good idea to meet in person. This was such a huge decision and a huge presentation. And it just makes it easier to answer those questions back and forth versus um, the virtual. So I appreciate everybody coming today, even though we may not have used the materials as much as we thought. So um, thank you for that. And now our next meeting is on May 18th. 2023, I think that'll probably be virtual, back to virtual. Um, but I think this was, was well worth it. So thanks again, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, we're up